On a hot August day in Tucson, Arizona, something terrible happened at the fancy Saguaro Sunset Resort. August 15, 2017, people found the dead body of 20-year-old Ethan Morales in one of the expensive suites of the hotel. Detective Rowan Steele, who had worked for many years in the Tucson Police Department, came to investigate. As he stepped into the suite, the contrast between the opulent surroundings and the lifeless form of the young man was jarring. Ethan's body was lying over a big piano. Next to him were an empty bottle of pills and a glass half full of whiskey. Detective Steele felt that something was not right about this situation. His many years of experience told him that this case would not be easy to solve. While the crime scene team looked for clues, Detective Steele noticed a picture on the bedside table. The picture showed Ethan wearing a tuxedo that didn't fit well. He was standing next to an old woman in a fancy wedding dress. The picture had been taken just one week ago. This strange discovery made Detective Steele even more curious about what had really happened to Ethan Morales. Ethan Morales was not the typical guest one might expect to find at the Saguaro Sunset Resort. A recent graduate of Tucson High Magnet School, Ethan was known as a quiet, introspective young man with a passion for music. Those who knew him described a gifted musician, always with a guitar in hand, dreaming of making it big in the music industry. Born and raised in a modest neighborhood on the outskirts of Tucson, Ethan's life had been marked by financial struggle. His mother, Maria Morales, had raised him alone after his father abandoned them when Ethan was just a toddler. Maria worked long hours as a waitress at a local diner, barely making ends meet to provide for her son. Despite their financial hardships, Ethan had shown promise from an early age. His teachers noted his exceptional talent in music, and he often spent hours practicing in the school's music room after classes. By his senior year, Ethan had become known as the shy kid with the magical fingers, capable of coaxing beautiful melodies from even the most battered of guitars. However, beneath the surface of his artistic aspirations lay a more complicated truth. Ethan struggled with social anxiety and found it difficult to connect with his peers. His only true friend was his guitar, and he often retreated into his music as a way to cope with the stresses of his life. After graduation, while many of his classmates were preparing for college or starting new jobs, Ethan found himself adrift. He picked up odd jobs here and there, mostly busking on street corners or playing at small local venues for meager pay. His dream of becoming a professional musician seemed increasingly out of reach, and the pressure to help support his mother weighed heavily on him. It was during this time of uncertainty and growing desperation that Ethan's life took an unexpected turn, one that would ultimately lead to his untimely death in a luxury resort suite, far removed from the humble beginnings that had shaped him. The community of Tucson was shocked when news broke of 20 years old Ethan Morales' marriage to Rosalind Blackwood, a 68-year-old widow known for her wealth and social status. The wedding, held at the prestigious Tucson Country Club, was a lavish affair that seemed entirely at odds with Ethan's modest background. Eyewitnesses described a visibly uncomfortable Ethan tugging at the collar of his designer tuxedo and avoiding eye contact with the guests. In contrast, Rosalind beamed with joy, proudly showing off her much younger groom to the assembled socialites and business magnates of Tucson's elite. The sudden union sparked widespread speculation and gossip. Some suggested it was a fairy tale romance, while others whispered about more sinister motivations. Rumors circulated that Rosalind had a history of seeking out younger men for pleasure. Ethan's former classmates expressed disbelief unable to reconcile the image of the shy, reserved musician they knew with the young man who had just married into one of Tucson's wealthiest families. Maria Morales, Ethan's mother, was notably absent from the wedding. When approached by local reporters, she appeared flustered and refused to comment on her son's marriage, fueling further speculation about the circumstances surrounding the union. As Detective Steele delved deeper into the case, he found himself increasingly puzzled by the dynamics of this May-December romance. The opulent wedding, the evident discomfort of the groom, and the conspicuous absence of the groom's mother all pointed to a situation far more complex than a simple love story. Little did anyone know that this unexpected marriage would be the first domino to fall in a series of events that would ultimately lead to tragedy. 
leaving the community of Tucson grappling with questions of morality, desperation, and the lengths to which people might go for financial security. Detective Rowan Steele, known for his meticulous approach and unwavering dedication, threw himself into the investigation of Ethan Morales' death. His first step was to interview the key players in this perplexing case. Rosalind Blackwood, now Ethan's widow, was the picture of grief when Steele arrived at her sprawling mansion in the Catalina foothills. Dressed in designer black, her eyes red-rimmed but her composure intact, she recounted the events leading up to Ethan's death. Ethan was troubled, Rosalind said, her voice quavering. He struggled with the attention our marriage brought. I thought a night at the resort might help him relax. She went on to explain that Ethan had a prescription for anti and anxiety medication, suggesting that he might have accidentally overdosed. Steele noted the convenient explanation but remained skeptical. He pressed further, asking about the nature of their relationship and the considerable age gap. Rosalind's responses were practiced, almost too perfect, raising more questions than they answered. The detective's next stop was the small apartment where Maria Morales lived. The contrast with Rosalind's mansion was stark. Maria, looking exhausted and distraught, initially refused to speak about Ethan's marriage or death. However, as Steele gently probed, cracks began to appear in her reticence. I didn't want this for him, Maria finally blurted out, tears streaming down her face. But we were desperate. The debts, they were crushing us. She hinted at financial troubles that had plagued the family for years, but clammed up when Steele asked for specifics. As the investigation progressed, Steele and his team uncovered a trail of financial records that painted a troubling picture. Large sums of money had been transferred to Maria's account in the weeks leading up to Ethan's marriage. Additionally, a substantial life insurance policy had been taken out on Ethan, with Rosalind as the sole beneficiary. The autopsy report added another layer of complexity to the case. While it confirmed that Ethan had died from an overdose of prescription medication, the levels in his system were far higher than any normal dosage. This raised the possibility that Ethan's death was not accidental, but either suicide or murder. As night fell on Tucson, Detective Steele stood on the balcony of the police station, looking out over the city lights. He knew that somewhere in this desert metropolis, the truth about Ethan Morales' death was hiding, waiting to be uncovered. As Detective Steele dug deeper into Rosalind Blackwood's background, a pattern began to emerge. Rosalind, it turned out, was no stranger to marriage. Ethan had been her fourth husband, and each of her previous marriages had ended under questionable circumstances. Rosalind's first husband, a real estate tycoon, had died of a heart attack just two years into their marriage, leaving her a substantial inheritance. Her second marriage to a retired judge had ended in divorce amid rumors of infidelity and financial disputes. The third, to a prominent local politician, had dissolved after he was embroiled in a corruption scandal, with Rosalind emerging unscathed and significantly wealthier. But it was Rosalind's relationship with her only child, Gregory Blackwood, that caught Steele's attention. Gregory, a 45-year-old failed businessman with a history of substance abuse, had been estranged from his mother for years. Interviews with family acquaintances revealed a bitter feud between mother and son, centered around Gregory's repeated attempts to access his inheritance. Rosalind cut Gregory off years ago, a family friend confided to Steele, said she'd rather give her money to charity than see him waste it on drugs and bad business deals. The detective's interest was piqued further when he discovered that Gregory had returned to Tucson just days before Ethan's death. Witnesses reported seeing him arguing heatedly with Rosalind outside her favorite country club. As Steele pondered these new developments, he couldn't shake the feeling that Gregory Blackwood might be the key to unraveling the mystery surrounding Ethan's death. The question was, how did this prodigal son fit into the puzzle of a young musician's untimely demise? As the investigation entered its second week, Detective Steele received a breakthrough that would change the course of the case. A search of Ethan's childhood home, conducted with Maria's reluctant permission, uncovered a hidden journal tucked away in a guitar case. The journal painted a haunting picture of Ethan's inner turmoil. Entries dating back several months revealed a young man grappling with depression, anxiety, 
and a growing dependence on prescription medications. Ethan wrote about the pressure he felt to support his mother, his fading dreams of a music career, and his deep-seated fears of disappointing everyone around him. One entry, dated just weeks before his marriage to Rosalind, stood out. Mum says this is our only way out. I don't want to do it, but I can't let her down. Not after everything she's sacrificed for me, but the pills are the only thing that make it bearable. I feel like I'm drowning, and no one can hear me screaming. The journal also contained references to someone Ethan called the supplier, a person who seemed to be providing him with extra medication beyond his normal prescription. This information set off alarm bells for Steele, suggesting a possible connection to local drug networks. Concurrent with this discovery, the forensics team reported finding traces of multiple prescription drugs in Ethan's system, some of which he didn't have a prescription for. This cocktail of medications, they concluded, had likely contributed to his death. Steele turned his attention back to Maria Morales, armed with this new information. Under intense questioning, Maria's carefully constructed facade began to crumble. She admitted to being deeply in debt, owing money to people she referred to vaguely as dangerous individuals. I was desperate, Maria sobbed during the interrogation. We were about to lose everything. When Rosalind showed interest in Ethan, I saw it as our only way out. I never meant for him to get hurt. But Steele sensed there was more to the story. Digging into Maria's background, he uncovered a history of small-time cons and petty theft charges that she had managed to keep hidden from her son. More disturbing was a series of connections that linked Maria to a local pharmacy technician known for illegally distributing prescription medications. As the detective pieced together the evidence, a troubling picture began to form. It seemed that Maria, driven by financial desperation, had orchestrated her son's marriage to Rosalind for possibly financial gains. But the plan had spiralled out of control, with Ethan turning to drugs to cope with his situation. The question that now haunted Steele was whether Ethan's death was the tragic result of his own despair, or if someone had seized the opportunity to turn an addiction into murder. As he stared at the evidence board in his office, the detective knew that he was only scratching the surface of a case that would shake the foundations of Tucson's high society. Just as Detective Steele thought he was beginning to understand the dynamics at play, a new piece of evidence emerged that turned the case on its head. An anonymous tip led the investigative team to a safety deposit box registered under Ethan's name. Inside, they found a life insurance policy worth $5 million, taken out just days after his marriage to Rosalind. The policy named both Rosalind Blackwood and Maria Morales as equal beneficiaries, adding a new layer of complexity to the case. This discovery cast both women's actions in a new light and raised questions about their potential collaboration. When confronted with this information, Rosalind appeared genuinely shocked. I had no idea about this policy, she insisted, her usually composed demeanor cracking. Ethan must have arranged it without my knowledge. Maria, on the other hand, broke down completely. It was Rosalind's idea, she confessed through tears. She said it was just a precaution that nothing would actually happen to Ethan. I never thought, I never wanted. The revelation of the insurance policy shifted the focus of the investigation. It now appeared that both Rosalind and Maria had potential motives for wanting Ethan dead. The question was whether they had worked together or if one had acted alone, possibly manipulating the other. Steele also couldn't shake the feeling that there might be more players involved. The size of the policy and the speed with which it was approved suggested connections in high places, possibly linking back to Rosalind's influential social circle. As news of the insurance policy leaked to the press, the case captured national attention. Tucson became the center of a media storm, with reporters digging into every aspect of Ethan's short life and his relationships with both Rosalind and Maria, the detective knew he was racing against time. With the spotlight on the case, pressure was mounting from both the public and his superiors to solve it quickly. But Steele was determined not to let the clamor for a resolution lead him to overlook crucial details. As he reviewed the evidence late into the night, Steele couldn't shake the feeling that there was still a missing piece to this puzzle. 
Little did he know that the key to unraveling the entire case was about to walk right into his investigation. As Detective Steele delved deeper into the source of Ethan's drugs, he uncovered a sophisticated underground network operating within Tucson. This network, specializing in the illegal distribution of prescription medications, had tentacles reaching into unexpected places. The detective's investigation led him to a nondescript strip mall on the outskirts of the city. Here, behind the facade of a struggling pharmacy, he discovered the hub of the operation. The pharmacy technician Maria had been in contact with was just a small cog in a much larger machine. Steele and his team orchestrated a series of raids, revealing a startling truth. The drug ring had connections to some of Tucson's most prominent citizens. Doctors, lawyers, and even a city council member were implicated in the scheme. Most shocking of all was the discovery of Maria Morales's deep involvement in the network. Far from being a desperate mother drawn into a world she didn't understand, Maria was revealed to be a key player in the distribution chain. She had been using her position as a waitress to make connections and distribute drugs to a wealthy clientele. This revelation cast Ethan's entire life in a new light. The young man's struggles with anxiety and depression suddenly seemed less like personal demons and more like the result of a toxic environment orchestrated by his own mother. As Steele pieced together the extent of the network, he realized that Ethan's death was just the tip of the iceberg. The case had evolved from a tragic overdose to something far more sinister, with implications that could shake Tucson to its core. Just as the case seemed to be coming together, a new player entered the scene, throwing Detective Steele's carefully constructed timeline into disarray. Gregory Blackwood, Rosalind's estranged son, had indeed returned to Tucson in the days leading up to Ethan's death. Steele tracked Gregory down to a seedy motel on the outskirts of town. The man he found was a far cry from the polished image of the Blackwood family. Disheveled with sunken eyes and trembling hands, Gregory was clearly battling his own demons. Initially hostile and evasive, Gregory's demeanor changed when Steele mentioned Ethan's name. That poor kid, Gregory muttered, a mix of pity and guilt crossing his face. He had no idea what he was getting into. Steele pressed for more information. The full extent of Gregory's involvement began to emerge. He had returned to Tucson, not just to confront his mother, but to warn Ethan. Gregory revealed that he had uncovered evidence of his mother's pattern of marrying vulnerable men and orchestrating their deaths for financial gain. I tried to tell Ethan, Gregory said, his voice cracking. I went to that resort to warn him, but I was too late. She got to him first. Gregory's revelation added a chilling new dimension to the case. He provided Steele with documents and recordings that suggested Rosalind had been systematically targeting vulnerable individuals for years, using her wealth and social status to cover her tracks. But Gregory's story also raised new questions. Why had he waited so long to come forward? And how did his own troubled history and estrangement from his mother factor into the situation? As Steele dug deeper, he discovered that Gregory's return to Tucson wasn't solely motivated by altruism. Financial records showed that he was deeply in debt, with loan sharks breathing down his neck. His attempt to warn Ethan may have been genuine, but it was also clear that he hoped to leverage the situation to gain access to his mother's fortune. This new information painted a complex picture of intersecting motives and desperation. Rosalind, Maria and now Gregory each had their own reasons for wanting to control the narrative around Ethan's death. The young musician had become a pawn in a deadly game of greed and survival. The case came to a head on a sweltering Tucson evening, exactly one month after Ethan's death. Detective Steele had called Rosalind, Maria and Gregory to the Saguaro Sunset Resort for what he described as a final statement gathering. The tension in the luxurious suite was visible as the three suspects eyed each other warily. Steele began by methodically laying out the evidence he had gathered. He spoke of the insurance policy, the drug network, Gregory's warnings, and Rosalind's history of suspicious marriages. As he talked, the facade of unity between Rosalind and Maria began to crumble. You told me the insurance was your idea, Maria shouted at Rosalind, her composure finally breaking. You said it was to protect Ethan. Rosalind, her usual poise slipping, fired back. And you were all too happy to go along with it, weren't you? Anything for a payday, even selling out your own son. As the two women argued, Gregory sat silently, a mix of disgust and relief on his face. 
But when Steele turned to him, asking about his own role in the events leading to Ethan's death, Gregory's demeanor changed. I tried to save him, Gregory insisted, his voice rising. But none of you cared about Ethan. Not really. He was just a means to an end for all of you. The confrontation reached its climax when Maria, pushed to her breaking point, finally confessed. I gave him the pills, she sobbed. Rosalind said it would look like an accident. She promised we'd both be taken care of. As Maria's confession hung in the air, Rosalind lunged for her purse, pulling out a small revolver. But before she could raise it, Steele and the hidden officers he had stationed in the room tackled her to the ground. In the chaos that followed, the full truth of Ethan's tragic death came to light. It was a sordid tale of manipulation, greed and desperation, with an innocent young man caught in the crossfire of others' ambitions. In the days following the dramatic confrontation at the Saguaro Sunset Resort, the Tucson Police Department moved swiftly to wrap up the case. Rosalind Blackwood was arrested on charges of conspiracy to commit murder, fraud, and illegal possession of a firearm. Her history of suspicious marriages would now be thoroughly investigated, potentially leading to more charges. Maria Morales faced charges of involuntary manslaughter, drug distribution, and fraud. Her role in the local drug network led to a series of additional arrests, dismantling a significant portion of Tucson's illegal prescription drug trade. Gregory Blackwood, while not directly implicated in Ethan's death, was charged with attempted extortion and drug possession. His cooperation with the investigation, however, was expected to lead to a more lenient sentence. The arrest sent shockwaves through Tucson's high society. Many who had attended Ethan and Rosalind's wedding just weeks earlier now found themselves caught up in the investigation, their connections to the drug network exposed. For Detective Steele, the resolution of the case brought a mix of satisfaction and sadness. While justice would be served, he couldn't shake the tragedy of Ethan Morales, a young man with a promising future destroyed by the greed and desperation of those around him. As the case made national headlines, it sparked discussions about elder abuse, exploitation of vulnerable individuals, and the hidden drug epidemic in seemingly affluent communities. Tucson, known for its beautiful desert landscapes and vibrant culture, now grappled with the dark underbelly that had been exposed in its midst. In the months following the arrests, Tucson struggled to come to terms with the tragic events that had unfolded. The case of Ethan Morales became a cautionary tale, leading to increased scrutiny of May-December romances and a renewed focus on mental health support for young adults. Detective Rowan Steele, hailed as a hero for solving the case, found himself grappling with the moral complexities it had exposed. The lines between victim and perpetrator had often blurred, revealing the desperate lengths to which people might go when faced with financial ruin or the temptation of wealth. As Tucson slowly healed, the story of Ethan Morales served as a somber reminder of the hidden struggles many face behind closed doors. It challenged the community to look beyond appearances and to reach out to those in need before desperation drives them to unthinkable acts. In the end, the desert sun continued to rise over Tucson, its light illuminating both the beauty and the shadows of a city forever changed by one young musician's tragic tale. If you love the documentary, make sure to put down your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time.